Okay, so I am what you call a nervous traveler, which is a problem because I'm a professional travel writer. <laughs> During a tropical thunderstorm somewhere, there's about a 60% chance that I'll end up sleeping in a hotel bathtub, just to be <laughs> safe. Mosquitoes freak me out. I get claustrophobic in crowded marketplaces. And if everybody's enjoying their welcome drink at some eco-lodge somewhere, I am the one person scanning the horizon to see where the medevac helicopter is going to land in an emergency. <laughs> it's true. And my editors have no idea that this is the situation, so I would love it if, if we can keep this in the room. <laughs> so knowing that, picture this. It's a Tuesday morning, and I'm doing what I do on a Tuesday morning. I'm pouring a bowl of cereal. I'm, cutting, I'm making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for my son and cutting off the crusts. I'm pretending to make coffee while I check my iPhone. <laughs> and an email comes in from an editor who says, David, we'd like to send you to the Omo Valley of Ethiopia to visit with some vanishing tribes. He explains that a massive hydroelectric dam is going in on the Omo River, and that 200,000 indigenous people are in danger of losing their livelihood and some of their traditions that are tied to the natural flood cycle. He says, there's one outfitter taking outsiders up onto the river, and we'd like you to go with him to chronicle what's happening there. And by the way, you need to tell us today if you can do this. I Google Omo Valley, and these are the images that come up. <laughs> the 15 ethnic groups living on the banks and uh, hills along the Omo River are so cut off that there are no written languages. There's no calendar. An Omo clock is a string that's tied with knots to indicate the number of sunsets before an event or a gathering. I write back for more information, and I, it's all coming together very quickly. And I get a note from the guy running the expedition out of Nairobi who says, well, having been to Africa before, you're already up to speed. But do be aware, you have probably never been anywhere quite as remote or inhospitable as the Omo Valley. <laughs> if you are inconvenienced, by Spartan accommodations, intense human contact, or our apprehensive and unfamiliar situations, then I'm sorry, but this expedition is not for you. And when I write back to say that this, in fact, would be my first trip to Africa, he sends a note saying, well, prepare to be uncomfortable. <laughs> I tell my family around the breakfast table what's going on, and the mood in the room is best summed up by my 10-year-old who looks at me and says, as only a 10-year-old can, Daddy, you're never going to do this. You've never even slept in a tent before. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Every fiber in my being is saying, I am not the person for this assignment. I'm literally thinking, call Sebastian Junger. <laughs> but then something changes. And I'm not sure if it's because I'm being pressured to make this decision on the spot, or because my son is harassing me, or because fear is just sometimes a, an excellent and terrible motivator, but a thought comes into my head, and it's this. Why not me? And then, as if I'm viewing the scene from above in slow motion, <laughs> I go to my computer and type a note to my editor saying, I'm in. Why not me? Why not me is this kind of magical incantation to myself that reminds me, no matter how neurotic I'm being, no matter how overwhelmed I am, that I am responsible for the shape of my life. And why not me doesn't solve everything, but it gets you going. It's where the work begins. And I mean, it takes me a month to gear up for Africa. I go and buy the biggest sun hat you've ever seen. <laughs> I have a big head. I get mosquito-proof clothing and really expensive tech socks. And then I go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and a psychologist, <laughs> and a meditation expert. <laughs> and then comes the day where I kiss my family goodbye and fly off from LAX to Heathrow, Heathrow to Nairobi. In Nairobi, I get on a small chartered Cessna and fly over what looks to me like the surface of Mercury. And we land almost at the border of Ethiopia. There, we pile into a Land Rover, and we drive and drive for hours, not even on roads, but on these sand tracks, until we come here to the oxbow of the Omo River. 
And if you can notice, I'm, my pants are tucked into my socks to avoid getting mosquito bites. <laughs> <laughs> From there, we walk down a path and we get onto a boat. And this is not like a carnival cruise ship. This is an 18-foot handmade fiberglass boat with a little canopy tarp over it. I mean, it is like the African queen. And it's the only motorized vessel within 200 miles on this river. And we head, we head up river. Now, this is a huge stretch for me. And every day, for the next 10 days, at some point, I think I'm going to die. I mean, there's a, there's a day, that this first day on the river, we're, we're about an hour in. And again, this is my first day ever in Africa, really. The boat's going along, and it hits something. The outboard motor goes dead. I see the faces of the drivers kind of tighten up and their hands go on their hips, which in Africa means something is really wrong. <laughs> I look on the dashboard, both gas gauges are on empty. The boat is kind of tilting sideways and backwards. I look out into the water and I see a, a, a log and it starts kind of wriggling around and it's a crocodile. I turn to my guide, Michael Lawrence, who is one of the most respected and experienced guides in all of Africa. I, I, he, he doesn't know how nervous I am, but I, I, and I don't want him to know, even though sweat is trickling down my neck. I say, Michael, what do you do in a situation like this? <laughs> he says, David, do not give over to phantom fears. <laughs> Great. All you can do is think about what's next. And what's next is, I see an umbrella in the corner of the boat, and if I need to, I'll use it as a paddle and paddle us to shore. Love it. As he's talking... <laughs> Somebody bangs on the motor, and we're back in business. Michael's still looking at me. He says, David, you've got a tsetse fly on your head. <laughs> okay. A tsetse fly is a fly that has a very sharp bite, and it also carries something called sleeping sickness. He plucks it off. I look on the shore. I see dozens and dozens of young men, very animated, very fit, putting white clay from the river on their body and all kinds of elaborate designs and on their faces. It's, it's incredible. Around them are older men with long sticks and AK-47 rifles, which are, I'm finding, ubiquitous in the Omo Valley. Our boat turns and heads directly in their direction. <laughs> I say, Michael, what's next? <laughs> Michael says, David, what's next is that's where we're camping for the night. It turns out that 42 young men of the Kara tribe were getting ready for a ceremony to welcome them into adulthood. And we followed them as they went from the riverbank up into a clearing about a mile in at their village. And we watched, and eventually we joined them as they danced into the night. And it was hot, and it was dusty, and it was also just one of the most incredible celebrations I've ever seen. I mean, this was a Kara bar mitzvah. <laughs> And the next day, we went into the village and sat with this new circle of elders, and they sacrificed a goat in honor of our arrival and told us we were the first outsiders to ever witness this ceremony. Now, for the next days that followed, we got to see more and more incredible things every day and more and more incredible ceremonies. And I, part of me kept saying, what am I doing here? But a bigger part was saying, what if I said no to this whole thing? I mean, this part of Africa, and this part of Ethiopia in particular, has been a crossroads for humanity for many, many thousands of years. Some of the earliest known human ancestors have been found right here on the Omo River. Turkana boy, the Leakeys found some of the oldest fossils, Australopithecus. And to be here in what could be the twilight of this period of culture, what could be the last days of the Omo, it was unsettling, it was sad, and it was also just a profound privilege that made all the struggle to get there worthwhile. Now, <laughs> you don't need to go to the Omo Valley of Ethiopia to test yourself out this way or to test out your fears this way. I mean, you could do it right here. There are plenty of fears right here that we can play with at home. <laughs> Journalism, for instance, is a scary landscape right now. Paradigms are shifting. Jobs are going away. Charticles are becoming listicles, and yet a core group of us soldiers on and continues to make the magic happen. In 2003, I started an online community called UPOD, and we under-promise and over-deliver. 
And we are a group of hard-working, talented, and optimistic freelance writers, and we are challenging ourselves every day to get to this place of why not me. And it's not about getting stuff done as much as it's about showing each other what we're capable of doing. So we'll hold each other accountable to making our A-list goals happen. And we'll read each other's work, and we won't just say, yeah, that's great. We'll say, like, actually, no, you could do better than that. Or we, we have our own language. And there's a word that I came up with that I'm proud of, and that word is thumb slam. Okay? So a thumb slam is what happens when you take your thumb and you slam it down against the send key in an act of boldness and no looking back. Okay? <laughs> So let's say you're sending off your first freelance article to a national publication, and you're, you don't want to second guess yourself, you're going to thumb slam it. Or you've labored for years over this novel, and you've sat around and telling all your friends about this novel, but you're finally ready to send it out to an agent. Thumb slam! <laughs> I mean, you don't even have to be a writer. If you want to reach out to a potential mentor for coffee, which can be a scary thing to do, you could thumb slam that. Or let's say, like, this is the year you're going to tell your mother, we are having a vegan Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thumb slam. Thumb slam. It is the physical manifestation of why not me. It's, it, it, somebody in my group calls it a high five for one. <laughs> Does it always get you where you want to go? No. Sometimes it leads you to crazy places. I mean, there was a day after I thumb slammed my way to Ethiopia that we, we walked for 11 miles in 110 degree heat to get to this village, only to realize when we got to the village that the entire village had moved down to the last sorghum hut. We had to walk another four miles to get there. But then when we got there, Something incredible happened, and I, I kind of can't believe there's a photo of it. I had no idea someone was taking these, these pictures. I call it my good muti moment. Muti is a word from South Africa that my, Michael, my guide, taught me, and it means traditional medicine, but it could also mean a good experience or a good person. And when we walked into this community, it's called the Dasanesh community, and I realized that the kids, some of these young kids, were speaking English, and they're the first generation to speak English. We have no idea what's next for, the, for these kids because everything's changing and things are moving really quickly. But I knew in that moment they just wanted to connect and they just wanted to have fun and like make fun of me and my big hat. <laughs> and, and so I had lost all sense of fear and self-consciousness and was just in that moment. So we talked about the river and they told me that they walked for three days to get to school and then they stay there for four days, and then they walk three days to get back. And we talked about the crocodiles. And, and then I just started, you know, doing tongue twisters with them, which they were repeating back to me. And I was doing old camp cheers from my summer camp that I hadn't thought about since I was their age. You know, it was like, give a rickshaw, give a buckshaw, give a rickshaw, buckshaw, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and they did it back to me. And, you know, it wasn't a big moment, but I felt like, I was completely myself, and it was a completely authentic moment. You know, we tell ourselves these stories about who we are and what we're capable of doing, but it's possible to rewrite those stories also. I mean, when I got the invitation to do this TEDx talk, an old story came up, and it wasn't me, it wasn't my son this time, but it was me who said, you're never going to do this! <laughs> But then, you know, you marshal your strength, and you take a deep breath, and you do one of these. And it's funny, because I asked Michael Lawrence if he had any advice for me today, thinking he was going to say, David, do not give over to phantom fears. <laughs> but in fact, he said, David, if I ever had to give a TED Talk, I'd be far more nervous than you ever were in the Elmo Valley. <laughs> we all have our angels and our demons. And it's true. And so, you know, I would love you to think about what yours are. So if there's something that's been stirred up today on stage that you'd like to turn around by saying, why not me? Great. If there's something you want to make or do or try that, that, that you can put into motion, that would be excellent. And, you know, it could be something like simple, like you want to start a company or you want to start a, join a foundation, or, <laughs> you know, something, something small like that. Or it could be something radical, like you want to quit your job and take a solo trip around the world, or homeschool your children. Or it could be a more personal challenge, like letting go of resentment, or asking for what you really want from the people in your life. That's hard to do. 
or just saying I love you. Whatever it is, nobody else can live your life the way you can. This is it. The river is moving. Why not you? Thumb slam. Thank you. Thank you.